For thousands of years, we as humans have actually been using tools to do things that we can't do with our bare hands. These tools have been becoming more complex, more intricate, and allow us to do things that really have one goal, to improve the quality of our life. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So then, uh, somewhere in the 1800s, someone had the bright idea that they were going to take these tools and use them as an extension of the body. Now, I'm not convinced that this wingsuit worked at all, and I don't know what the wheel in the middle does, <laughs> but I'm sure they had fun trying. So if we use these devices and these tools as extensions of our body, what are we trying to do? Well, about 100 years later, humans did figure out how to fly. So this is, again, all about doing things that we can't do, okay? Changing our abilities and increasing what we can do to some new level. And then something happened in the 80s, the 70s. Something remarkable happened. Computers uh, began to develop, right? And, do, and were able to do things that we can't do, again, with our natural abilities. Computers were filling up rooms and then later they were miniaturized, okay, and they became smaller and smaller. Then the personal computer came out, okay, and we had these in our homes. And then finally, we developed microchips that could fit in the palm of our hand. Then came the bionic age. We literally were now taking these tools and these technologies, not only using them as extensions of our bodies, but actually trying to put them into our bodies. We were implanting these technologies uh, into our bodies to do things like to treat cardiac conditions. The first pacemaker was introduced in the late 70s. In the middle, you'll see the cochlear implant, which came later and built upon the knowledge we had from the, uh, from the pacemakers. And then finally, on the right, what you see is the first brain implant. About 13 years ago, I had the privilege to be involved in some of the very first uh, studies where we put tiny electrode arrays into the motor area of people who were completely paralyzed, okay? This was the first time we were now directly connecting the human brain to the computer and then opening up many, many possibilities. And I'm going to tell you about that today. So this term bionic really is an old term and it's now actually coming back and it's becoming popular again. And it's simply the combination of biology and electronics. But what we're finding is at that intersection there are many, many challenges but also many opportunities. And again, in this effort to try to do things that we can't do with our own natural bodies. But the problem is, what is going to happen in the future? What happens if this, this trend continues and we continue to merge with machines, in essence? Okay? So what is going to guide us in this effort? What's going to actually drive uh, this development? My argument today is going to be that if we focus on quality of life first, and we look at this, this plot as the advancement of technology on the horizontal axis, and quality of life is on the vertical, and as long as we keep our eye on the slope of that curve and we try to improve quality of life and continue along that trajectory, then everything should be okay. But what happens if the trend goes the other way? What happens if machines and devices and artificial, uh, artificial intelligence, AI, gets pulled into the picture? And now we're merging with machines, connecting our brains to machines that can outthink us. That's going to be the critical question. But the argument, again, is going to be, I think we can control this trend, and I think we can stay in a safe place if we focus on the early part of this curve. Okay, quality of life. That should be driving where we go with this today. This is Ian Burkhart. I want you to, I want you to look at, at Ian here in this picture. Ian was out uh, on vacation out uh, in the ocean, and he dove into a wave which drove him into a sandbar headfirst. He ended up with a fracture at the C5 level, became completely paralyzed from the mid-chest down. Ian has no use of his hands. He can't walk. Um, and he needs help to do basic things like to clothe himself. I met Ian about five years ago, and Ian became interested in a study that we had been planning for many years. 
And the goal of this study was simple. We wanted to actually place a device in his motor area that would look at his signals, his patterns in his brain as he thought about movements that he hadn't done in years, but to attempt to reroute those signals to his muscles and allow him to move again. That was the simple goal. And when Ian started the study, we asked him, what was his goal? What did he want to get out of the study? And he had a simple answer. He said, I just want to be able to pick up a cup with one hand and take a drink without having to ask for help. Okay, that was Ian's goal. Now, he preferred that it would be beer in that cup, but uh, <laughs> as a young man, that was totally understandable. Uh, but no, what really then occurred was that uh, Ian uh, began the study, and the surgery went, went well, um, and the chip was placed, and we were starting to collect signals from his brain, and everything was looking good. But we ran into a problem right out of the gate. Every single time Ian would open his hand and grasp an object and try to move it even six inches, he would drop the object. Every single time he tried to do something functional and useful, he would drop the object and he couldn't manipulate it. So what was happening was that we discovered that the patterns in his brain were changing so rapidly as he thought about not only grabbing but moving that we couldn't keep up. And so we then went back to the drawing board and we spent months trying to develop uh, smarter algorithms and using AI and using machine learning to try to keep up and adapt to these pattern changes. So after a lot of hard work uh, on Ian's part and the team, of course, this is what Ian was finally able to do in the first year of this study. Remember his goal. You did it. That was an incredible moment. Uh, I still remember it, uh, the smile on Ian's face. His father was there, uh, his family was there. Um, it was absolutely amazing. But we still had a lot of work to do. What we also, we started to learn was that we had completely bypassed his spinal cord, okay? And that left us yet another problem. So I'm gonna do an experiment with everybody here and I want you to raise your dominant hand if you're able to, please, okay? Now take your other hand and drum your fingers against the palm of that hand very fast. Go as fast as you can. Okay, now stop. Now go the other direction. Reverse the direction. Okay, now do it again the fast way and pay attention if you're doing it from pinky to index or index to pinky. Okay, keep that in your mind. Now, how many of you are going from pinky to index is your natural fast way? Okay, good. How many of you are doing index to pinky? Okay, you guys are just strange. <laughs> no, let me make you feel a little better. Uh, in the population, the distribution the, is actually 85% do it from pinky to index. And 15%, the strange group, does it the other way. So why is that? Why in the world do we have a natural way of doing this? So I've even tested my kids when they were young and I never saw them you know, sitting around the house drumming their fingers. Uh, that came later when they became teenagers. Uh, but basically, I had one of each, okay? So the question is, why is that? There have been studies now to really look at patterns of activity, not only in the brain, but in the spinal cord. Your spinal cord has 10 million neurons alone, okay? Nothing compared to the brain, but 10 million neurons. What does that mean? It means that the spinal cord itself does computations. It actually facilitates movements. There's a place you can stimulate in the spinal cord and you can see an entire movement of the leg, an entire cycle of walking, okay? All without the brain being involved, all right? And so now we have bypassed the spinal cord completely in Ian. And so he was not able to do things like rhythmic movements. Now drumming the fingers is, is one thing, but brushing your teeth, scratching, Okay, doing these basic things that are necessary. Now, what we figured out was that there are two patterns in the brain and we could actually decipher between those two patterns. And so again, after a lot of work and, and a lot of training with Ian, here's what he was able to do uh, with a popular game. So one day he said, you know, I'm, I'm getting a little bored with these sessions. Uh, can we do something like a video game? Again, natural for uh, a young man in his early 20s. 
And he said, can we try something, a Guitar Hero-like application? And I thought it was a little bit crazy, uh, but you know what, it made a lot of sense. You could track the reaction time, you could look at how fast the movements occurred, you could see how complex they were, all in an engaging uh, type of environment. So watch what he was able to do after practice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that was his first time. So look at that hand movement. You would not know that that is someone who's quadriplegic, who's paralyzed and can't use his hand at all. So Ian had made yet another breakthrough. And the question was, what else could we do with this technology? Could we really impact quality of life? This young man uh, is Stephen Haywood. He had uh, in, enrolled in a study where we were trying to basically uh, allow him to communicate more effectively with his loved ones. Stephen had ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. He couldn't move, he couldn't speak, he couldn't even evoke facial expressions when I met him. It had progressed that far. So the goal, and this is locked in syndrome, okay? So the goal was to allow him to reconnect with the world, to be able to communicate and control, for example, the cursor in his computer and just use his thoughts to move it around, surf the web and do useful things and write emails. And I still remember one of the times I was uh, with him and he tried to move the cursor and he was struggling and he was having some difficulties and his son came in the room and jumped in his lap uh, and he said, go daddy, go, you can do it. And all of a sudden his performance went up. It was absolutely amazing. And I think this speaks to uh, the power of encouragement, the power of, of being reconnected you know, to the world and to your loved ones. Uh, there's another uh, aspect of paralysis uh, with spinal cord injury in stroke victims is the loss of sense of touch. I mean, can you imagine not being able to feel the hand of a loved one, not being able to feel objects as you, you, know, you pick them up? You try to pick up a cup of coffee to control the grasp. So those are the things that uh, we're looking at next. And those are the things we feel are very important. Okay, so now, again, let's think about quality of life. So this is opening up new doors and opportunities, though. Okay, if we're connecting our brains to the computer and we can connect our brains to the Internet, then does that mean that we could Google just by thinking about it without having to pull our phones out? That's really a possibility now. So does that mean when you go in to take a test, that the teacher is going to say, okay, put away your calculators, put away your phones, and turn off your brain implant? I mean, really, think about it. And so I was talking to my daughter about this uh, the other day, and she's, you know, and I said, you know, what do you think about this? And she's 13 years old, and she said, and why would anybody want to do this? <laughs> a very logical question. Uh, but then I showed her this quote, okay, from Ken Olson in 1977, who said, there is no reason anyone would ever want a computer in their home. How wrong could he have possibly been? <laughs> what an amazing quote. <laughs> and so, really as we think about this, the bionic age is here, okay? And it's not going away. It is going to grow and accelerate, and we're going to continue to use technology in our bodies. We're going to continue to use brain implants to treat diseases and conditions such as paralysis. We're already treating par uh, Parkinson's as well. Uh, and we hope to, to treat stroke and even traumatic brain injury one day. But I think that as our guide, as we progress, if we continue to focus on quality of life and we look at the needs that the patients have, okay, where they can benefit the most, and we focus on that early part of the curve, then I think we're gonna be okay. And if we remember the true pioneers in this new frontier are the patients, okay, like Ian. And by the way, this is when Ian met John Glenn. Um, what an, you know, another amazing moment. Uh, true, you know, pioneers, uh, two different areas, uh, but now we're going into a new age where the patients are the ones we have to follow as they break new ground. And if we stay focused on their needs and what they um, need to function and need to improve the quality of their life, I think we'll be okay. And the question will be, will computers and machines outsmart us or we, will we outsmart them? But if we follow this principle, I think it's safe to say we will outsmart them. Thank you. Thank you.